Just waiting a moment. Looks like we attendees are still joining us. Hello, welcome everyone. I am Rachel Paul with IAAAP. Thank you for joining us today for our first webinar in the EU webinar series. Before we begin, just a few items to go over. We do have closed captioning provided. You can select the closed captioning icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We do have attendee microphones muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. We encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A today, and the chat will be monitored for any general dialogue or technical issues. So happy to turn today's program over to Susanna Lorin. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> so we are not only providing uh, live captioning and sign language today, but we also have uh, automatic translation into other European languages. And this is a very cool technology that we are trying out, uh, not for the first time, but in this, as this is the first of a series of webinar, this is the first time we do it this way. So please uh, make sure that you uh, think about this being machine learning technology and it's not perfect. It can, it can never be as good as a live captionist, of course, but we do think it's a very good way to provide uh, other languages as well so that we know that more people can follow what, uh, what is going on here. So for those of you who, pro who prefer to have the captioning in a separate link, uh, my colleague uh, Rachel will put the, the link to the English uh, caption also in the chat. And then we will also provide the other languages. So, vous pouvez lire les sous-titres en français si vous suivez le lien fourni dans le chat. Sie können das auf Deutsch lesen, wenn Sie dem im Chat angegebenen Link folgen. Puedes leer en español si sigues el enlace provisto en el chat. Du kan läsa texten på svenska om du klickar på länken som vi lägger i chatten. And now I promise to stop doing that because it will take too long if I continue. So um, why IWP EU refresh? What does it even mean? IWP is a global organization with thousands of members in more than 70 countries around the world. We have members in Asia, Africa, the Southern Hemisphere, Middle East, Latin America, North America, including US and Canada, and of course in Europe. In the accessibility community, the US has been seen as the forerunner when it comes to both legislation and technical development. But in the daily professional life of an EU-based designer, developer, or content manager who has accessibility as part of her work description, the US can seem quite far away. The latest news on yet another litigation process where a company is being sued for not complying to the ADA doesn't really help me understand how I am supposed to handle the requirements of the digital service in front of me. So our members in the EU need local advice and local expertise who knows exactly how to interpret the EU regulations and European standards, and they want to discuss accessibility issues in their local languages. That's why IWAP has chapters, and that's why we also have an EU-level umbrella covering the directives and requirements that are the same across the EU. Because even though the largest ICT companies are based in the US, and many of us do look west for inspiration, it's now the EU that is leading the way when it comes to pushing accessibility forward. The minimum requirements of the Web Accessibility Directive are defined in the EN301549 standard, 
which in turn refers to WCAG 2.1 from 2018. The US accessibility legislations point to WCAG 2.0, published in 2008. Does anyone even remember what the web looked like 13 years ago? Okay, my intention is absolutely not to start a quarrel of who is doing things in the most clever way. When we could still travel, I spent a lot of time in the US and I love it. But my point is we do things differently and therefore I believe we should use the beautiful EU principle of subsidiarity. This means that decision-making is to be done as close to the citizens as possible. So chapters locally supported by the EU level for the things that unite us. When we sent out um, the EU IWP EU refresh messages in 17 languages, we got a lot of attention, but one question uh, I wasn't really prepared for, and it's this one, if you could share the screen. Yeah. The next one. Yeah. No, the map, the map one. Yes, this is what we sent out. Um, it's a map, it's a blue mm, illustration of kind of a map of kind of EU with the EU flag around it. So the question I got was, did the UK rejoin the EU? And I can assure you that even though I'm very honored to be the IWAP representative to the EU, that's not in my power. So the question was of course triggered by this map uh, and it's not very detailed, but uh, it does include our friends on the other side of the channel and the EU stars. So I wanted to share this because when we first launched the IWAP EU initiative back in 2018, we did call it IWAP Europe and some people think that would be a better name. And we even made a logo. So, but as the driving force behind this is essentially the common EU regulations, we decided that IWAP EU would be more fitting. At the same time, the UK chapter is an important player even outside of the EU. Norway, part of the economic zone, but not an EU member, is part of the Nordic chapter together with Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And the DACH chapter covers Germany, Austria, as well as German speaking parts of Switzerland, a country famous for its independence. So, Point taken, the map is not perfect, but we prefer to be inclusive. After all, that's what accessibility is about. That's really what I had on the background of this. So now let's talk about what's here and now and also the future with a specific focus on EU plus friends and family. And I will now turn over to our very distinguished panel and I want to underline that this may not be the most gender balanced panel I have ever put together, but when it comes to diversity of sectors and geograph geography, um, we have a very broad coverage and an impressive competence and experience in the panel. So their long and impressive bios are on the webinar website, so you can read all the details here and I just want to make short introductions. Uh, let me start with what is arguably the most important panel. Alejandro Moledo from the European Disability Forum, representing end users with disabilities. The reason anyone is working with accessibility, well, it may not be Alejandro himself, that is the only reason, but individuals with disabilities certainly are. And the relentless work that he has done over the years has certainly contributed a lot to awareness, policy and regulations. So thanks for joining us today, Alejandro. The second panelist is Shadi Abuzara, a living legend from the W3C. And I usually present him saying that he's responsible for everything that has to do with WCAG, and he gently corrects me. He is, of course, not. And I am perfectly aware that there are loads of brilliant minds in the W3C and also volunteers working on the standards. But Shadi has been and still is instrumental to the development of accessibility standards in the EU and beyond. And maybe I should have uh, also invited Etsy and Sen and Senelec, but Shadi and I are both in the Etsy Special Task Force and the Joint Working Group, where I also wear another hat and representing the Swedish Standards Institute. So actually the two of us together, we do represent three European standardization bodies plus the W3C. So that's quite impressive. And I'm extremely happy to also have the opportunity to welcome June Lowry Kingston, head of unit of the DG Connect uh, of the European Union. She is leading the, all the decision making going on uh, around the directive and also supporting the monitoring agencies of the member states in enforcing the directive. 
I'm very grateful and honored to have you with us today. And thanks a lot for taking the time. I know you have a very tight schedule. We also have representation from the different latitudes of IAAP. And within the IAAP, we have professional members from industry, academy, public sector, disabled persons organizations, and so on. So very diverse in itself. We have Gary Moore from the AbilityNet, one of the original founders of IAAP, who runs the UK chapter. We have Gottfried Zimmermann from the Media University of Stuttgart, one out of a group of organizations, including ICT companies and disabled persons organization behind the DAH chapter. We have Alejandro Rodriguez Ascaso from the Open University in Spain, who will be deeply involved in the Spanish chapter that is just be, uh, taking off right now. And I want to kindly remind my panelists to provide short responses and not long presentations, please, so that we got dynamic discussion and everyone gets the chance to speak. We will continue with a short discussion here with the, with the panel and then I will leave it open to the, uh, to the audience to also ask questions. So starting with the common regulations on web accessibility already in place and more to come, um, we do have common standards and regulations and, and requirements across the EU. But the everlasting question about how to determine whether something is accessible or not is maybe more relevant than ever. So <clears throat> when we created the implementation acts and the monitoring methodologies, we, um, we decided to not want, we wanted to leave room for innovation and not be too prescriptive for different reasons. And therefore uh, the member states are doing things in slightly different ways and it makes it difficult to compare. So my question is to the panel, do you think certification of accessibility professionals or some other kind of means, maybe another set of standards or other ways of solving this issue would be the best, best way to move forward? And I wanted to start with, with the IAAP representative we have from Spain, Alejandro, the, one of my two Alejandros today. <laughs> um, um, what is the Spanish um, experience or, or how do you feel about this in, in Spain? Would certification be a way to move forward or is there other ways of, of solving this issue from the Spanish uh, perspective? I think that definitively certification is a, is a very good way to move forward. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, Fundación Onte who is a strategic, playing a strategic role um, uh, between uh, end user organizations, um, companies, public administration, and universities. And I think the secret of, of, of the success in Spain and other Spanish speaking countries will be how to, how to address the, this, all these actors uh, playing together. And certification is, of course, a way to improve how we all uh, manage to test whether a requirement is. Com is complied with or not. I would remember that the, the standards available are already a step toward that because uh, fulfilling the, the European standard is not mandatory to, to fulfill uh, the regulation. You could try even other ways to prove that the main principles are. So the standards is, are already there. Uh, and then I would also like to emphasize that for I've been teaching the same for all since 2004. In the beginning, we didn't have much guidance on what we should teach about Design for All in ICT. And uh, we, only, we had the ACM curricula, but of course it's not their mission to give details on every field and, and accessibility, of course, was not an exception. And then uh, we had very good European uh, uh, funded projects to give us um, uh, some kind of systematic knowledge about what we, sh we should teach uh, teach learner, learners on. And I think certification is coming to provide us a way to update our uh, syllabus and also to give a, a student a common view on how technology can be tested. I think uh, we are very uh, looking forward to have this certification placed in Spain and I think it will play a key role. Thank you, Alejandro. So from the UK perspective, Gary, is certification sort of a driving force in the UK or how do you see this? Well, I think, I think for this problem at large, Susanna, um, I think the most important thing to the success of this initiative 
is to get the level of human capital uh, involved in it up, you know, to get more talent involved um, who regard expertise in this area as critical, uh, you know, socially important to them, but professionally important to them as well. Um, you know, until we get the those professional skills much more widespread with a bigger talent pool, it'll be very difficult to deliver against the ambitions of all of these standards. So I'm a big fan of uh, certification of individuals. Um, it broadens the talent pool, but it also helps people understand what professional capacity looks and feels like in this area. So certainly from the AbilityNet's perspective, we put a big emphasis on it. Um, all of our digital accessibility experts are actively encouraged to achieve the appropriate uh, IAAP uh, certifications. Um, yeah, so in the interest of being brief, I think that's my main point. And thank you for continuing to include the UK under the general heading of <laughs> European. Yes. <laughs> of course, we couldn't let you out, Gary. That would be that would be awful. So, Gottfried, what about the German-speaking part of Europe? Um, what's your feel there? Well, um, we see some momentum going on here through the IAAP DACH chapter, and uh, we have translated the the syllabi. Um, but I think we are the most fragmented chapter of all the chapters. So we, we have, um, at least in Germany, we have a level of the national level, we have uh, the, the monitoring agency there, and we have the federal states with their own monitoring agencies. And we've seen that they have actually different interpretations in, in details of, of the rules. And we have uh, established communities, um, established test, uh, testing communities like the BIK, big uh, B2B tests and, and others. Uh, and, and it's quite difficult here to, to really um, to, to make them all agree on even on, on this uh, German and, and DACH level. Um, I think what we need, and I, I kind of agree with Gary, the first thing we need really is to build up um, the, the capacity of, of knowledge, of expertise, and also build up networks to, to have an exchange here. Um, and um, then in, in the second step, I think we can, at some point, we can expect more harmonization on the interpretation of, of the rules and requirements. Okay, so more, I, I usually say that if you have more than one accessibility expert in the room, they don't, they tend to disagree. And then we put more of them in there and, and we get less disagreement. I, I wonder how that will work, but I want to turn to June. So from the European Commission perspective is sort of alignment and, and doing everything the same way and providing the exact same result in all the member states. It's how important is that really? Well, actually, it's not very important at all, I think it's safe to say. So um, I totally agree with what uh, Gottfried and Gary have said in terms of making that talent pool bigger. And I think that's really where we are right now in terms of prioritizations. Obviously, we greatly appreciate what the IAAP does in terms of professionalization of the competences, in terms of offering assurance to whether it's member states or any website owner to actually know that somewhere they're employing knows what they're doing because it is is a, a little opaque at times at the moment whether someone really is a web accessibility expert how do you prove that however the directive is deliberately uh, um, not even ambiguously worded is deliberately worded to allow for diversity of approach exactly as you said Susanna at the beginning subsidiarity this is subsidiarity in practice you know and love it or hate it that's what it looks like it's messy and getting the directive negotiated, I understand, was quite messy. And there is a deliberate tension there or an explicit tension there between having clear rules and saying, this is what accessibility looks like, which is what we have with the standard saying, this is what we call a presumption of conformity, meet that standard in your way, and we'll accept and that that website is deemed accessible or that mobile app. But on the other hand, it's up to the member states whether they want to go further than that standard in their transposition and turning that into national law or how they want to interpret that and how much resources and uh, their approach to that. So 
I'm sorry to say this is the EU in practice. It's not, you know, despite what some people on the other side of the channel might think, it's not really prescriptive and saying you have to do it this way. We're really letting all the member states find their own way to uh, improve accessibility in public sector websites, which is of course what we're, we're focused on with the Web Accessibility Directive. We are reviewing that directive now. The review will have to be completed by mid next year and uh, there will be an open public consultation on that. And of course, all views are very, very welcome. We'd like to have a diverse and very full participation in that consultation. That's all I'll say for now, I think. Thank you. So that's that's rewarding. But I think for, for the member states, I, I hear from the member states monitoring agencies that they are a bit frustrated about not knowing exactly how, how to do this. So if we go to the end user perspective, Alejandro, the other Alejandro, um, um, what, what do end users think? Is it a problem that something can be deemed accessible in one country and not accessible in the other? Or, or is, just, is it just sort of nice that we have diversity between the countries? I mean, uh, well, th thanks. Th thank you very much, uh, first of all, for in inviting <laughs> inviting us um, into this discussion. I, I think, I mean, accessibility, as we all know, is, is a technical issue. So we've always been advocating for more professionalism in, in the accessibility sector, not only on the digital side of, um, of it, but also the built environment, transport, and so forth. So we do support the um, the upscaling of accessibility prof professionals and the really a certification of who's an accessibility professional. But we, if we look at the uh, monitoring, um, the different monitoring methodologies applied on, at member states level, I mean, the level of accessibility will remain the same. We know that is uh, is at least uh, weak uh, level A and double A. And then countries, as June said, can go beyond. So to me, uh, the key factor, even though it is messy uh, and it is uh, difficult and some member states don't know exactly how to do it, the most important thing is to find a way in which monitoring leads to improvement. So because we are not monitoring for the sake of yeah. you know, knowing which country performs better than other and be able to name and shame, the, the, the reason behind monitoring is to be able to improve and to understand internally, uh, inter by internally I mean in the country, which uh, systems work best, which uh, um, techniques, uh, which technologies, and, and that's the purpose of it. So having more professionals which can undertake this task, uh, implementing and also monitoring and also and I would add here the possibility for end users, for people with disabilities to acquire those um, competencies and be able to become accessibility experts is of great importance to, to us as well. So I would say that, yes, in, in overall, we do uh, support this, uh, this, um, this initiative of creating more and more accessibility professionals. And in terms of monitoring, our main focus is to involve end users and be sure that with monitoring, after monitoring comes the improvements. Yes, many, many good thoughts in one, in one breath. Sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm just, you're really like a politician, you can sort of bake everything together into what you wanted to say, no matter what I asked you. So that's very good. That's Alejandro <laughs> yes. going wild and crazy. Uh, so no, but I, I, I agree with you, of course. And, and I just wanted to also to share that, I mean, the IAAP, the certification is kind of the a tool, it's not the end goal, of course, the, end, the, the idea is to raise the awareness and raise the competence in the whole industry so that when you hire a person that's claims to be an accessibility expert or when you when you um, procure accessibility expertise that you know that, that these people know what they're talking about. So the certification as such is not sort of the, the end goal. Um, and uh, from the standardization standpoint, Shadi, now you're talking for all the standardization bodies <laughs> or at least W3C. So do you think it's a problem that people interpret your standard in different ways? Yes. <laughs> um, was that short enough? <laughs> Can I elaborate now? <laughs> so um, I think we're, we're discussing things at at least two different levels here. One is having differences between one member states and the other in terms of the scope. 
you know, is kindergartens part or not, or, you know, these kind of things. Uh, some countries go beyond um, the minimum requirement, which is good. Um, this is very different than not agreeing on what's accessible, what's not uniform standard. And I think this is really essential, really critical. And the whole directive was built on um, the, the uh, whatever uniform market or whatever it's called, internal market, um, to, to make sure to harmonize that because my disability does not change when I go from one country to another. Um, and, and so having common standards. Now, the standard is not perfect. I'm long enough here. I've been working on digital accessibility since before there was the, the WCAG, before the WCC standards. Uh, there were back then only the Trace uh, Center guidelines uh, to kind of orient uh, people towards. And it was a very, very bad situation. Everybody was doing different things differently. Um, now, things have been improving. Um, I think as with um, Alejandro from Onte was saying, um, you know, adding more guidance, but also improving the standards and continually working on improving the standards. There's work on accessibility conformance testing ACT that is being rolled into WCAG 2.2, which is coming up later this year. Um, we're also working on WCAG 3.0 to add more testing. Um, so I want to say three things. Standards, <laughs> Uniform standards is one important part of making the web accessible. Um, guidance, more guidance and resources around that, and the expertise, building the expertise. This comes to the certification aspect that you were asking about, uh, Susanna. And I think really, as other speakers were saying, I think it's the education behind the certification that is really important. Um, and for this certification to be oriented to the international standards. Actually, certification, if it's not harmonized with the standards, could actually have the counter effect of producing more fragmentation. So it's important that these things play together to create this need. One last point, I've been here long enough as well to see certification effects from before. Uh, I think in 2005, there was the Eurocert initiative that tried to standardize across Europe, have certification. My personal take is back then, there wasn't the environment uh, ready enough. There wasn't the industry involved, uh, the different organizations. Um, now we're at the much more mature state. We have the policies, we have the industry, we have the societal awareness. So I think, you know, there is no silver bullet. It's many pieces. Um, and definitely I think the education and expertise building, um, be it then uh, indicated by certification, I think is definitely part of that. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a big, um, for all of you young people who weren't there when we tried to do the Eurosat um, and other certification initiatives that had been going on also in the community um, for a long time. The IWP certification is certifying competence, people, the professionals, and not the, not the website or the interface. So that the two, or at least two different ways of certifying things. So what IWP is doing is not trying to put a stamp on the website saying this is accessible. Uh, they are putting a stamp in, in people instead and saying that this pe this person know what he or she is talking about. And I think that is that is a different approach that hopefully will be more successful and really pushing towards more boots on the ground because I think we all agree that we need more people who are not only accessibility experts but who has another profession but also know enough about accessibility to, to support uh, this going forward. So uh, I want to come back to, to June uh, about this. So you say that this is the, the beauty of, of, of Europe. We are doing things differently and that's fine, but, but isn't it, wasn't it the idea of the directive or one of the objectives of the directive is that, you know, to promote the inner market and everything. So if things are really different in different countries and that we interpret this in, and I, I don't mean that we go beyond the minimum requirements, but I mean the actual accessibility that, and, something that is seen as a super 100% accessible, if that exists, website in Sweden is not the same as a website in Bulgaria because we, we interpret what the requirements actually are in, in different ways. So we say that, you know, isn't that a problem at all to the commission? Do we, I mean, don't we sort of miss the point a little bit with, with at least yeah. one of them? No, that's a very legitimate question, uh, Susanna. And really at the moment we're in a, we're still in the early stages. So the member states have to report for the first time to the commission by the end of this year. And we have to issue a, a report, a sort of consensus, a consolidation of that by uh, mid next year. And so we're all in this learning stage. So uh, 
many of those represented know. We uh, talk regularly to the member states and to their web accessibility experts within the, uh, the government bodies. And we are, I think this problem is becoming clearer as people's experience becomes more uh, deep and really it's sort of learning by doing. So as I say, this I think will be a key part of the review. It's a very hotly discussed topic. What indicators are people using to monitor exactly as Alejandro said, you know, we're not doing this just for the sake of monitoring, we're doing this so that people actually progress and that they can monitor progress and show that the resources being invested across the different member states are actually leading to positive change. And so the question of how do you measure that? How do you show that? How do you show what's changing? And we know that the different member states often have different approaches, different, exactly as you said, can a website ever be 100% accessible? Or can you just say, it's not bad? It doesn't have the obvious faults in it. Um, at the moment, the WOD directive is very, very, um, has very broad categorizations of not accessible, partially accessible, fully accessible. You know, and off the record, although obviously on the record as we're recording, I would expect everything to be in that partially, or hope most things at least are in that partially compliant category. And that really isn't a very refined tool for monitoring progress if everything's in there. And so I think we have to, we will have to address this. We will have to find more sophisticated ways of measuring this, but we're still very early days in terms of the implementation of the directive. Yes, and as I am involved also in the review, I. <sighs> Sort of, I have a problem with this. What are we going to provide us? <laughs> How are we going to compare things when we get the reports? That's that's it's going to be interesting. And I also think it, it's not only kind of the reporting and, and how we measure things, but it's also really to be able to remediate, to be able to fix things. We need to know what the end goal is. And, and if I'm not aware that this is, is not accessible, then then I how am I supposed to ever fix it? So I think it is important that we have some kind of common understanding of. of, of how we are going to interpret things because otherwise it will be really, really hard to, uh, to move forward. But it's, it's good to hear that, um, that we are all in agreement that we need more, more people working on this and that we think that the training and what IAAP is also sort of pushing for and promoting is, is hopefully helping um, uh, to, to push this forward. So if we go to what other means we can use for, for pushing for accessibility, because I think everyone here wants the Web Accessibility Directive to be successful and want to um, really improve accessibility for, for people with disabilities. So except for the uh, having more people actually understanding accessibility, which is of course the, maybe the most crucial thing, but what else would be the most important thing to sort of solve uh, or how to make the, the directive uh, a success? What, what do you think, Shadi? Uh, is the answer more standards or well, the, the, the guidance around the standards, I, I know this is a very uh, standard centric view of the world, but um, this, this is exactly the question that we're wrestling with right now in the design of WCAG 3.0 is completely rethinking the conformance model, this rigidness that we have in the standard. Um, but at the same time, not going as far as writing policies, uh, right? Uh, so there's... Uh, aspects related to, 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 to policies, uh, like when an organization cannot afford to do certain things or so on. But there are things in the requirements, what is, what is um, a, a, a fault that is negligible, right? It is a barrier, but it's not so bad. And most evaluators will put a comment and say, technically it doesn't meet WCAG, but you know, it's fine. Uh, that's the general practice right now. Can we encode this in the standard and make this more transparent? to people who don't have to have 20 years of expertise in order to be able to make that judgment. Um, uh, one of the ways that, you know, this is my personal reflection is making the requirements, breaking them down to even smaller bits and pieces. Uh, this will make the standard longer uh, and bigger. That's the, the counter argument, but it will encode the things more directly. I don't want to get too technical, but the idea is to have exactly these situations a little bit more reflected in the standard to remove a bit the rigidity, have a bit of tolerance. Uh, so a few mistakes is fine. If it's too many mistakes, then um, you know your website exceeds a certain threshold and is not accessible. These are the discussions going on right now in W3C on WCAG 3.0. And I think this will be, again, a new generation from you know the 
the advancements that we've made from WCAG 1 to WCAG 2 to WCAG 3, um, um, uh, I think is, is a core part of the evolution of accessibility, these ongoing questions that we're wrestling with. But wouldn't it be difficult to make that into some legal requirements if it's like, or would you do percentage or how do you, how do you connect that to any legal requirements? We're figuring exactly that out. Um, I mean, I can give you my personal opinion, but, but this is all, there isn't a consensus yet. This is ongoing discussions. Um, you know, th th there are many different ideas, proposals being put on the table. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to go further unless you ask me. <laughs> okay, so we we'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, but it's good to hear that this discussion is going on. So from the... Um, from the IWAP perspective, uh, Gottfried, uh, what do you see from the German, fragmented German speaking perspective? What, do, what would be the most important issue to solve, to move uh, the directive forward and to be successful in, in making the world more accessible for the digital world? Yeah, um, I think our strength is really the focus on the people, on experts and persons. So uh, if you look at this multiplayer field, we are, our unique selling point basically is certification of persons and experts. Um, and uh, we need to connect people um, together with the different networks that we have, the standardization, governments, regulation, and um, uh, user organizations. I think that that's the strength that we need to play. We need to find processes that we, kind of democratic processes that we, we can shape opinions, that we can shape policies, bring them up, discuss them and then uh, bring them forward as, as a public, uh, in a public voice, in a public fashion to governments and to standardization. The answer is people, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's, really, that's good and more collaboration, I, I like that. So Gary, in the UK, what's your, what's your take on this? How is, um, how are we, I mean, the, the UK is, you already implemented the Web Accessibility Directive before you left us, so, so that's good. We, we still have a common regulation there, so, so that's good. But, but what would you say would be the, I know you have, are very strong on the sort of industry part of, of uh, your members in, in IAAP. So is it the industry who is going to drive this forward or how do you see it? Uh, I, well, I honestly do think it is, um, uh, shall we say, bottom up, Susanna. I realize that I'm in an environment on this call which is more top-down and regulation oriented. But honestly, um, I think the, the most important thing is to avoid proliferation of standards. I mean, the IT industry uh, generally has this background that the wonderful thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. Let's, let's not get to that situation in uh, accessibility, you know. Um, and WCAG 2.0, 2.1 has given big companies the confidence to invest in this because they know that uh, by investing in uh, this as a theme or a, a mandatory requirement driving through their big projects, they can absolutely more or less establish whether they've succeeded or not succeeded at the end. So um, let's, let's avoid proliferation of standards. Um, I think that's been important in getting us to where we are. Um, I, I go back to uh, agreeing with Gottfried that uh, people are a critical part of it and you know, continuing to provide more tools for training to broaden that pool is important. Um, uh, I think regulation has had a positive impact in the UK, I would say. If I look at our, not just the uh, web accessibility regulations, but also the public sector um, imperative that we saw introduced a couple of years ago in the UK. In the last 18 months, there has been a vast amount of activity across all providers to public sector in the UK. So um, although we lack effective enforcement mechanisms, probably uh, in the UK or arguably in the UK, the, the combination of standards and uh, strong leadership, shall we say, from the um, legislature has, I think, had the right impact uh, for people with disabilities trying to consume these services. So, um, yeah, without summarizing my own comments, I'd, I'd leave it there. 
<laughs> so thank you again. That's very, it's always very heartwarming for me to hear that even though the Web Accessibility Directive is only sort of covering the public sector, we have so many proof of how it sort of trickles down to or spreads out to, to the generalist uh, ICT community and, and the, the other ICT suppliers, because that is what we see as well. And it's always good because that means that the power of this directive is sort of much bigger than, than only the public sector, even if the public sector. If I could just add one, if I could add one last comment, uh, yep. Susanna, I think again, um, whilst there are, is one dominant standard, we will see more and more investment from big tech, the people who produce the tools that manufacture websites and applications. And they, as long as they've got confidence that there is that standard, they will continue to invest heavily to give the software developers the tools that build more and more and more of this in routinely and automatically without higher levels of skill being involved. So, um, yeah. So if everything was built in from the start, then we wouldn't have to train all these millions of people. So that's that, that would be really good. So. I hope that happens. So if we go to Spain, uh, Alejandro Rodriguez, um, what's the Spanish take on this? Do you, what, what would be the most important thing? You can't say people now because everyone else has said that. So is there a second <laughs> uh, important thing to, to make sure the Web Accessibility Directive becomes um, successful in, in Spain and otherwise? Um, just let me add uh, my two cents to the comment by Gary of the, on the proliferation of standards. I read the, the document by Saga on the how the, the standard about the standardization request uh, dealing with uh, for supporting the, the European Accessibility Act, and I think it's quite sensible the position to use the same standard and to add the necessary annex and not to have different standards for uh, uh, supporting the regulation. Having said that, I wouldn't say people. I think in Spain, we, th we need to do more than that because certification is not really playing a key role in Spain nowadays. Yes, our computer scientists, our graduates and our graduates just go to companies and they are hired um, and, and they don't need really certification. So how we could, I think certification is something tangible that in the Spanish chapter, they could use it as a way to attract industry and universities user organizations, uh, um, accessibility advocates, uh, uh, and overall universities. They need to convince universities that maybe uh, we can orientate, we, we could help our students to, to design their future and see that accessibility is, uh, is a good way to, to find a job and to, to do a, a very good professional life. And I would say we still need to convince people that this is the, the good way. I see it clearly. And I think that, as I said before, Fundación Once has a, a strategic role among all these different agents to push that forward. Yeah, so good luck Good luck with the Spanish chapter when it sort of takes off, off for real. I, I really hope that we can do a lot of good because the, the, when we have more material in Spanish, we can also reach a, a very large population also outside of Europe, of course. So the, the Spanish initiative is, is extremely important to us. Yes, from the Spanish National Distance University will be hopefully fu um, supporting Fundación Once in, in, this, in this very nice project. And I, we will be going to ask you for advice for sure or for all the different chapters in Europe and to Christopher, of course, about how you are proceeding. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we will keep on collaborating with this to move, move things forward. So I wanted to turn to, to June also to ask, what do you think is the most important thing we can do except for making sure that more people are aware of accessibility and know how to do that. We sort of build a strong profession in this, but, but what else do you see as sort of key success factors um, for the directive to be successful? Yeah, can I just answer one question that I was gonna type the answer to, but I realized I pressed the wrong button. So I'm gonna answer live instead. Someone um, had reported accessibility problems of a public sector web page, didn't receive an answer, reported it further, didn't receive an answer. You can contact us about such a case. I mean, normally you'd go up through the member state as you, exactly as you did, monitoring body, ombudsman, but then you can contact us if you're not getting anywhere and we will, uh, uh, reply to that. So in terms of what, um, how we really think we need to progress, well, I think as, as the others have said, um, I don't know why accessibility isn't 
sort of 101 in your ICT course or bootleg camp or stuff. You know, IAAP does brilliant professional training. Some others do as well, but really um, we need to be getting the next generation and it needs to be as instinctive for them as anything else that they do. And, and uh, especially when we don't know how this technology is going to develop, you know, when the Web Accessibility Directive was being negotiated, you know, many years ago now, um, mobile phone use, the apps use wasn't as, as uh, extensive and ubiquitous as it is now, you know, as we move towards XR, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, where will we be in another 10 years time? If we're not capturing this generation of people coming through now, they're not going to have that instinct. And I think that's really important. So I don't know quite what we can do about that, but we're certainly thinking about it because it seems to me an absolute gaping hole in the system at the moment that we need to fill somehow or other. Um, and, you know, obviously retrofitting and raising awareness for people already, on, you know, advanced on their professional path is one thing, catching that, uh, that new generation who are gonna be developing the technology and the apps and the whatever it is in five, 10 years time is very, very important. Um, and uh, there was a question in the chat about, you know, the Web Accessibility Directive, only public sector. But as you say, we see this spillover effect and we do see that um, some of the big uh, industry players now whether that's social media players making it easier for people to you know use social media in a more accessible way a way prompting alt text and things like that having better you know uh, uh, accessibility features built in whether into the devices or into software is um is much more common you know that they really are investing in that and i hope that that is setting the example that you know, this is what the default setting should be. Our product should be accessible by design and by default. And um, I really hope that as we see the impact of the web accessibility directives spilling over into the private sector websites and apps, we'll also see a similar impact from the European Accessibility Act. Now, the timeline for that is different to ours. I think the last implementation deadline is 2025, if memory serves. And so I know it's a long wait if your online banking isn't accessible, but I think we will see that bar being raised in practice as more services also in the private sector prepare for those deadlines that are coming in across Europe for a whole range of different services. Yeah, and I can, I thank you, June. I, I just want to add that we see along uh, a very big difference now that the Accessibility Act is, is approaching that the private sector is really on their toes. They are already awake. When, when we were this far away from the, the deadlines of the Web Accessibility Directive, the public sector, didn't. we didn't hear from them anything. But they woke up very, very late. The private sector needs, I think they, they have another view on compliance and I, I don't know really why, but, but I, see, I see a much bigger sort of, uh, interest in this. And we will, in this series, this is kind of the first webinar we have uh, with the EU topical, um, on the EU topic, uh, but the other ones we will have is on, on the regulations. We will have one webinar on the European Accessibility Act and another webinar on the uh, Web Accessibility Directive uh, review. So, so stay tuned for, for the upcoming webinars in, in this series if you are interested. I can see also in the chat there is a lot of discussions around the directives and acts and, and the differences behind them, but we, we will cover that in, in the upcoming webinars. I just wanted to give uh, the last word to the users. So Alejandro uh, Moledo, uh, what do you think is the most important thing that we as a community uh, can do to support the Web Accessibility Directive to make sure that the remediation is, is happening and not only monitoring? Thank you, Susanna. Not being to be a politician, but let me just add to what you said before. I think I, I may have an idea of why the private sector woke up uh, quicker than, than the public sector for the Web Directive. And the reason is the enforcement mechanism in the Accessibility Act is definitely stronger than the, the Web Accessibility Directive. But in, as Gary said, it's not only in the UK case, but I think in all of the EU, we have a little bit of a, an issue when it comes to enforcement, uh, enforcing the, the legislation. So uh, from, from uh, our community, from persons with disabilities, um, if I would need to, to, to highlight, I think users will need to, uh, we need to, 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 to be active and to really use the mechanisms uh, set out in the, in the legislation to, to use 
uh, the feedback mechanism, to use the enforcement mechanism, and um, the complaint mechanism, I mean, and uh, really to know what are our rights under the different legislation and make sure that these are, uh, these are applied accordingly. I would add to the list of, you know, uh, 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 wish list that we we mentioned uh, the previous speakers on people uh, would add people with disabilities enforcement and so forth. I would also curricula in in higher education programs as you mentioned as well. And I would add as well, which I think is very important, um, accessible authoring tools to make uh, to make possible for people with disabilities to work on uh, on uh, on digital technologies as well but also to make easier the creation of accessible content i think that's an, also a, a key factor in succeeding in implementing these accessibility legislations thank you alejandro that played very well into my <laughs> my hands while we are also um, um, presenting results from from a couple of research projects uh, aiming to to solve kind of that problem so stay tuned for the pre-GAD event that we are presenting on the 19th of, um, of May, uh, where we present the results of two research projects on, on authoring tools uh, by default accessibility. We did not, I did not pay him to say that, by the way, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true that it's the same thing that Gary talked about, having the default, and you know. I know, I know Shadi would mention the, the attack guidelines as well, in this case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So let's go on and let's see what we have. Uh, uh, we have an interesting question here about languages. Um, do you think that most countries will require websites and product interfaces to be localized in their in-country languages as part of the requirements for the understanding web accessibility principle? If so, will the country's requirements provide guidance if machine translated content, for example, Google Translate, will be acceptable to meet their standards? No one can answer this for sure, but is anyone prepared to say something about language? Because I think this is a, an extremely sort of important part of what the directive and the standard doesn't really cover in uh, right now, which is understandability yeah. on that level. I think we were the first ones in the German or uh, German speaking Dach chapter to translate the bodies of knowledge. So yes, we believe that it's important to, to, uh, to transport, uh, to translate into uh, local languages. Um, and because it, it is a much lower um, barrier for people, especially if they're already uh, professionals. Um, I wanted to, to add something. I think uh, what June brought up and others is really important. We need to make accessibility uh, part of uh, education, especially higher education. Uh, one idea that uh, I had for a long time in my mind is that I, I really want to make IAAP certification part or offer in my university, but it's expensive for students to, to pay for a certification. Could we kind of build partnerships between industry and, and students, academia, to, to enable something like that? Very good idea. Uh, let's, let's go find a big chunk of money and make sure we can provide it for free. No, no one would be more happy than, than, than us, but it does take, you know, the, the, this is really an official um, professional certification. It takes it is expensive to create and then it's expensive to, to make sure that it keeps uh, the quality standards and also translations are very, very expensive and so on. But, but definitely it should be, it should be possible to include um, the, this into universities. That would be a very good step forward. So let's see if we can get, get some funding uh, in place for that. And I know you have also been in, involved in several research projects uh, from, from your university in and several others are too, of course, in, in providing, trying to make sure that we sort of get web accessibility competences into the curricula of university studies. So there are initiatives going on in different parts of, of Europe and elsewhere, um, but still much more needs to be done, I think. And we have several questions around uh, sort of local initiatives and, and other uh, bodies providing standards or, or certifications and, and certificates. So, um, more of comments and 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 uh, people just saying what about other certifications that are not part of IAAP? There are uh, things like this going on uh, in different uh, regions, and of course that is well, I don't know them all, so I can't say that all of them are good. But but from IAAP standpoint, we we do think it's there is a uh, something 
um, it's positive if we can sort of join forces and, and do the same thing, align with the standards, align with the requirements in the, in the legislation and try to make sure that we, we provide the same thing. So if there are any initiatives out there that would like to collaborate with us, we're very happy to, to make sure that we do this in a good way. And, and we have already sort of um, combined things that are out there. We are not trying to force anyone to do exactly what we believe is the right thing. This is a community effort and the members uh, are deciding in different committees uh, how to move forward and what the, the uh, body of knowledge and the certification exam should contain. So it's definitely a possibility to, to collaborate with us and, and make sure that we do things that benefit all, all communities. So, Susanna, may I say something briefly on that? Um, yeah, from W3C perspective, the, another thing that we're working on through an EC funded project called Way Guide is we're developing Way Curricula uh, which is content to allow people at universities. Uh, we hear that from a lot of people saying, I teach IT, but I'm not an accessibility expert. If you can give me the content, I can um, include that in my courses, uh, things like that. Uh, we are seeing different kinds of certification efforts in, in different countries, um, also from other international organizations and so on. Too. So this is what I mentioned earlier about the, 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 the need to harmonize these with the international standards. Otherwise we have fragmentation, we have certification to teach different things. So these way curricula is a way to hopefully try to coordinate uh, um, among these and make sure that the different um, uh, initiatives um, are teaching the, the same material or similar. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. And it's there, there are, I mean, yeah, the need for harmonization. I think we can <laughs> agree on, on that and how important it is. So we have another question here, interesting enough, saying, is there a plan for a single automatic auditing tool, open source, that will be used to detect accessibility errors based on the ACT or ACT tools and all EU countries will use? So I will ask June, is the commission planning to create or, or procure or, or ask somebody to create a common tool? Oh. We're not asking, as I, as I explained at the beginning, we're not imposing anything. What we are doing, as Shadi has, has mentioned in terms of, uh, for example, university curricula, but also in terms of web authoring tools, we have uh, some money where we, and if we do have funding, then we're looking for open source tools that member states can then use, of course. And what we are also doing in our discussions with the member states regularly is getting them to exchange on what tools they're using. So we've seen some good demonstrations, some demonstrations of tools they're developing in-house and also looking at through open source so that we can try and encourage this exchange of best practice and sort of efficient and effective tools. But um, if we do develop anything, it will be open source, but it would not be imposed on anyone. Thank you. I remember these um, discussions we had during the transposition phase and there were really a, um, a clear majority. Everyone thought it was a good idea to have this open and we should, should not pose barriers. It shouldn't be too prescriptive and we must be open to innovation and all the different member states have different traditions. And that was really, that was really the, the consensus at that time. And now the discussion in the member states, why don't you give us the, the truth, <laughs> nothing but the truth? Why don't you give me a tool that I can use? So it's quite funny how, how this discussion has changed over, over the years, I think. But, um, but there are many tools out there. Um, and the work done by W3C uh, is really trying to make sure that, that the tools are, are working together towards um, similar, at least, interpretation. And I think that that, the, that industry is also sort of coming together slowly uh, to make sure that we get better results from the tools as well. Still, there are um, a little bit too much diversity between the results you can get from two different tools out there. So we have another question on how the IAAP can reconciliate the evolving standards with the static certification model. W3, no, WCAG 3.0, for instance, is not incorporated in the CPAC certification at this time, I believe. And uh, of course, the certification is a moving target as well. And uh, the certification is evolving. We have already updated the, the CPAC and I, I think WAS update is on its way as well. So it is uh, constantly evolving and it will um, keep on um, being developed as the standards move and, um, and the requirement, the legal requirements uh, are out there. And WCAG 3.0 is not a stable standard yet. So we can't sort of have a certification around that. But, but as long when, when we have a new standard uh, in the EU or 
on the US market or somewhere else, then we will of course update this, the certification. So the certification is not static in that sense. We do have uh, quite a lot of questions more. Uh, we didn't have the time to answer all of them, but thank you for your uh, engagement and all the IAAP related questions. I will make sure to answer to the ones that I can uh, where you have left your, your uh, name so I know who, who it is. Uh, some are anonymous, but, um, but I'm happy to answer them after the webinar. And I will ask Rachel to uh, do the closing remarks and thank everyone that needs to be thanked. Hey, yes, uh, thank you to, uh, to Susanna and all our panelists today for the great information and all the wonderful questions from our attendees. This was the first webinar, so I hope you'll join us for the second one coming up on the 26th of May at the same time, and it's going to be focusing on the European Accessibility Act, uh, focusing on e-commerce. And I also wanted to thank our sign language interpreters today and our captions for providing those services. Okay, thank you everyone, and have a very nice rest of your day. See you soon, I hope.